Well, hello everyone. I'm Mikhail Golovnia, Senior Advisory Data Scientist at Minitab. And uh, today I would like to address a very interesting issue and would like to convince you why we need predictive analytics in chemical engineering. So just bear with me and I'll show some very interesting examples and applications of predictive analytics in chemical engineering so that you may actually find something pretty interesting to work with. So first of all, let me start by introducing a pretty straightforward uh, data set over here. Here we have a toxicity data on about, uh, about 500 different uh, substances. And uh, each substance is described by a certain set of uh, chemical properties, a certain connectivity of a correlation index, whatever. There are a bunch of different things out there. There's eight of them altogether. And each substance has been measured in terms of its toxicity. So again, in this case, we have a classical application of predictive analytics. We would like to predict toxicity based on the corresponding inputs. Now, let me show you first what we would normally do with this type of data set in a classical linear regression setting. In this case, if I run a linear regression analysis, I used all of those eight inputs as my predictors. Uh, the software, in this case, I used Minitab regression module, estimates uh, this particular equation for me. And I also requested tenfold cross-validation to estimate a measure of R squared, and in this case, it's about 46% accurate. So it's not stellar, not spectacular, but it's also not zero. So we're somewhere in the upper 40s as far as the accuracy is concerned. Now, classical linear regression analysis, in this case, also identified that there is a two out of eight features, the property three and property five, that are shown as being highly insignificant. So if I follow the general guidelines and if I drop those two, I can get a revised linear regression equation here that uses only six input properties. And now my uh, cross-validated R squared went a little bit higher. So I, I was at 46.39 and now I'm at 46.69, okay? And all of these six inputs are statistically significant. Okay, now the big question is, uh, what do we do with this now? I mean, what, where do we go from here? Now, what usually happens in chemical engineering, uh, an example like what I've just showed to you would be an oversimplification. You usually deal with much wider and larger sets of predictors, and they usually hit the natural limitations of uh, classical linear regression analysis. Like, for example, in this case, if I had more than 500 individual properties. Let's say if I were to work with some mass spectrometer data or some other things that are usually highly correlated with each other, that would lead me into trouble. That explains also why oftentimes uh, classical linear regression is not being used directly in chemical engineering applications. So how can we approach that same problem if we had a large number of predictors? Well, what is usually done is uh, a whole family of techniques uh, when one of them is known as partially squares that proceed by summarizing all of these original inputs, and there could be lots of them, into individual component scores. So, for example, if I had uh, 700 of these different chemical properties, PLS regression would allow me to create in an intelligent way following certain internal guidelines and algorithmic prescriptions uh, of these linear combinations that are called here score one, two, three, four, etc. And by combining all of that initial information into this set of uh, orthogonal scores, I would be able to proceed and develop a reliable uh, linear regression solution, even in the presence of multicollinearity and a large number of inputs. Now, in this case, if I run this PLS process, and again, it's very popular among chemical engineers precisely for the reasons that I've just laid out. So if I keep adding the components, and in the PLS, the max number of components will be the max number of independent dimensions of the data cloud. So in this case, I could add all eight, and as I keep adding them, my R squared uh, on the training data will go up, eventually reaching the performance of uh, OLS regression. 
But it's also clear from this table here that if I retain four components, I am already within the ballpark of my overall regression performance. And these four components should summarize enough of the information available in the entire data set. In real life applications, sometimes chemical engineers will go to as few as two components and then they just look at the plots and do all of this. But you don't have to. And when you, when you look at all these different approaches, this uh, experiment becomes important because it allows you to see the level of information retention that you have as you construct those components. Okay, now how do we interpret PLS regression? First of all, once you've constructed those four components, what happens underneath is that those four components are used in a classical linear regression setting. So what I did here, I asked Minitab to score four components from PLS. And they went ahead and used Minitab regression module to generate classical or less regression using those four components as inputs. And notice this allows me to use tenfold cross-validation to estimate the unbiased measure of performance. And in this case, I'm getting about 45%. So it's not as uh, high as the linear regression on that reduced set of six significant inputs. Uh, but it's very close. It's within the same ballpark. And again, as I have said, each individual components, these scores 1, 2, 3, and 4, are constructed by creating a linear combination of the original eight inputs. Okay, so this is what we, ca uh, what we call the table of loadings. And this is uh, the coefficients that can be used to construct these guys over here. Now notice, because each of these components are a linear combination of the original inputs, at the end of the process here, regardless how you arrived at here using PLS, PCR, or any type of other regularized regression could include ridge and lasso, the end result of this uh, process is always uh, some kind of linear equation that combines all of the original inputs or a subset of them. So in this case, if I unroll all of these individual scores, then I will get uh, the ultimate set of coefficients, and uh, if I cross-validate, it gives me that particular measure of performance. And when I look at the coefficients, that's where I can see a lot of interesting pictures, and that's why PLS is so popular. So, in other words, the reason why we use PLS in chemical engineering is that it allows us to handle large number of inputs at ease without running into the limitations of the uh, conventional uh, uh, multiple linear regression. Now, on the other hand, the equation itself shows us how all of those individual coefficients may potentially contribute into the ultimate uh, uh, response or the, uh, the variable of interest, which in this case is the toxicity, okay? But it also has a certain set of limitations. And let me highlight that here because this is going to be the key to what I'm about to talk about next. Limitations of the current analysis. Notice that all these models, whether it's a, a traditional regression or any of its variants, PLS, uh, principal components regression, regularized regressions, etc., they all assume linear model structure. So the end equation is always going to look something like this or something like this. The coefficients will change depending on the method that you use. Okay? But this begs the question immediately, but what if the underlying model structure is nonlinear? Now, if the underlying model structure is nonlinear, then you will not be able to detect it using PLS or any of its flavor. So this is where modern predictive analytics will allow you to explore this possibility. So you're not abandoning PLS. It does wor its work really well, especially handling large numbers of inputs. But you can also gain even more advantages if you go into predictive analytics. And as a data scientist, and I've worked with quite a few uh, uh, data sets of that nature, and I know that usually stochastic gradient boosting would be the algorithm of choice to handle these types of scenarios. Now, predictive analytics module Minitab has the stochastic gradient boosting. It's super easy to use. It's very easy to set up. We also can give you all the training that you need. And you don't have to be a statistician or some type of genius mathematician in order to be able to use it. So let me highlight what is actually going to happen. If I take
take that same example, which is uh, the original set of eight inputs and the toxicity as my response variable, and then run it through a uh, tree nut gradient boosting engine in Minitab, what I'm going to get is the following. So I have a model that uses eight predictors. And off the bat, the cross-validated R squared of that model gives me almost 55% accuracy. Now remember, even the best OLS, R squared was only around 47. Now I've jumped up to 50 five percent that's a significant jump in addition to that it also communicates what are the actual features and how they are ranked according ranked according to their contribution and it clearly shows that property four and the connectivity property are uh, among the top most important followed by all of those ones now in addition to that three net also allows you to have a an uh, internal look into the model and try to understand what is the nature of those nonlinearities. Here's what happens. TreeNet gives you this type of output. And notice here I only reported on property four and the connect, the two top most important variables here. I could have requested plots for any other combination too. And notice that unlike property four, which exhibits some type of monotone, I would even say linear contribution into toxicity, the connectivity property actually highlights some of these local humps. And these are the nonlinearities that the traditional OLS regression or any of its flavors like PLS, PCR, lasso, etc., cannot are not capable of detecting. And if you look at the 3D plot, again, property four in the connect, you can actually see those two humps, local humps of toxicity. Now, depending what you're looking for to in having the highest toxicity, let's say you're working with a pesticide and you need to identify the optimal combination of inputs that are uh, most toxic or the other way around, you're looking for safety, etc., etc. These plots will allow you to see that immediately. So notice you stepped all the way above the conventional interpretation of uh, linear regression in any of its flavors. But you don't have to stop there. Here is what happens. Remember, when I ran PLS, I've added these individual scores. Now, it, it can actually be very beneficial for me to see if I can use these scores as inputs in uh, predictive analytics uh, uh, algorithm of the same type, say, like TreeNet. So if I run TreeNet not on the original scores, but on these derived scores, I can actually identify additional structure there. And here's what happens when I do that. Three net on the PLS components, so I took four of those components, and remember they summarize information, dominant information from the entire data set. It could be summarizing information from tens of thousands of inputs or spectral lines or whatever it is it that you're dealing with as a chemical engineering, uh, a chemical engineer. And notice in this case, it actually gives me a cross-validated R squared of 56 plus percent and remember that pls r squared when i ran it before and you can check out earlier in the video gave me only 45 plus percent here i'm getting 56 plus in other words i went 11 points up i'm almost imp improved my overall toxicity uh prediction performance by uh one-fourth of the original performance. This is a huge benefit. This is like enormously better model. So whatever it is there, that opportunity uh, would have been missed if we did not have access to TreeNet. And again, if I look at some of these uh, components as far as their contribution into the model, it shows me some very cool highlights. Again, score one, the first component appears to be monotone and somewhat linear. But when you look at a score three and a score four, especially score four exhibits these uh, uh, either a peak of toxicity or the other way around. And if you look at the 3D plot, you can clearly identify some of those dips and valleys. Now, this type of picture can generate lots of excitement among chemists, among your bosses, among your clients, and among all these other people who are engaged in these types of research. 
Because notice these are the types of things that cannot be identified by conventional PLS. And yet at the same time, I took advantage of the PLS to derive all of these important scores that you can look at how they are constructed and everything. You can study the loadings and all the other things. And on top of that, I've actually identified very cool nonlinearities and interactions. So to summarize, our findings in conclusion, what we've realized is that the modern predictive analytics techniques such as TreeNet, and again, this is what I would recommend you start with on this class of applications. They allow to enrich and augment the findings of classical regression analysis, including PLS. Like in this particular data set, it's a real life data set. TreeNet has dramatically improved the accuracy of the classical PLS model. When you saw it, the cross-validated R-squared went from 45 to 56%. That's a significant increase. And this increase in accuracy is explained by a significant non-linear interaction between the top or among the top PLS components, okay? And notice that the entire discovery process was quick and easy. All you need to do is to have access to the TreeNet engine, uh, specify the target, specify the predictors, and the predictors could be the components from uh, PLS regression, and then set several intuitive parameters there and run the analysis and get access to all of these pictures without any further uh, uh, processes or procedures involved. Okay, so as you can see, this is the advantage that you will have as a chemical engineer, if you have access to predictive analytics tools, specifically TreeNet. Now, is it going to be like this at all times? No, we cannot guarantee it because there will be classes of uh, data sets where you will not see these types of nonlinearities, and that is perfectly fine because you will get the assurance if you run TreeNet that you haven't missed any particular opportunity that otherwise could have given you a certain uh, advantage, whether you're a researcher or for the benefit of the company or for the benefit of the clients. So keep that in mind. That is why the predictive analytics is a very critical factor in uh, giving you an additional advantage that otherwise you would have missed. And the good news is that all of these techniques are available in many tabs. So by getting the predictive analytics module, you get access to tree net. You also get access to individual trees, uh, classification and regression trees. You also get access to random forest. And each of those applications has its own unique place and how it can help you to become a better professional, a better researcher, and a better engineer. So come to us, give it a try, use it in your own data, and I can guarantee you, you will get very excited as, uh, and you'll realize that you will not be able to live without at least trying predictive analytics on your class of applications, okay? So uh, best of luck with that. This is Mikhail Galonia, Senior Advisory Data Scientist at Minitab, and I'll see you next time.